Well, as David mentioned, um, Jeff McRae is snowed in in Baltimore, and he sends his regrets, um, but he asked me to come and deliver his uh, award address. Um, I have worked with Jeff <clears throat> for almost 10 years now, and I have a great appreciation for him as a colleague. He is as thoughtful as he is provocative, and no matter whether you agree with him or not, he always leaves you with something to think about. And I think you'll see that in his um, talk today. Now, Jeff gave me very ins specific instructions to read his talk, and being the conscientious person that I am, I will honor his request. So if you don't agree with what you hear, please don't shoot the messenger. Since my retirement, I have had more time to think about one of my favorite topics, food. And I've noticed something remarkable. The grand cuisines of France and China, the simple diet of the Inuit in Yanomami, the typical fare at a New York deli or a Texas barbecue, all are essentially the same. Everyone eats the same foods, and these foods fall into categories, of which there happen to be five. Vitamins, minerals, proteins, fats, and carbohydrates. This is the human diet. Incidentally, it is more or less the mammalian diet. However, it is equally remarkable that every culture finds its own unique ways to serve up these nutrients. Ways that reflect the local flora and fauna, religious taboos, cooking techniques, and so on. One cannot hope to understand food without considering both these levels. Its universal function as human nutrition and its deliciously diverse manifestations in different cuisines. I mention this because I think there is a striking parallel in psychology. I'll get to that in a minute, but first, I have to give you some background. During the 1980s, Paul Costa and I spent a good deal of, deal of time testing the hypothesis that personality traits could be summarized in terms of five, five broad factors, the so-called Big Five or Five Factor Model. These factors have been identified in English language trait terms by lexical researchers like Lou Goldberg, and we wanted to see if they were also found in scales designed by personality psychologists. Here is an example. A joint factor analysis of our neo-personality inventory and the continuous scales of the Myers-Briggs type indicator. Although the MBTI had been developed from a typological model based on Jungian psychology, its scales appeared to correspond directly to four of the five factors, although some are scored in the opposite direction. The last column, for example, shows that conscientiousness is the polar opposite of MBTI perception. Now, perception doesn't seem to have anything to do with conscientiousness, but if you examine the items, you find that people who score high on MBTI perception are those who react to the immediate situation without planning or thinking about the consequences, something that does clearly correspond to low conscientiousness. The beauty of the FFM is that it consolidates different theoretical perspectives and different trait labels into a common, empirically-based taxonomy. We found similar results with other instruments, such as Block's California QSET, Jackson's Personality Research Form, and Goff's Adjective Checklist scales. These kinds of data eventually persuaded us, and most other personality psychologists, that the FFM was indeed what Warren Norman had called an adequate taxonomy of personality traits. Our research, however, had been conducted exclusively in American samples, and the conventional wisdom of the day was that psychological processes were likely to be radically different in different cultural contexts. Anthropologists like Ruth Benedict, who were the first to study personality and culture, tended to argue that human nature was plastic and personality was created through the process of enculturation. Cross-cultural and social psychologists like Marcus and Kitayama had shown that identity, motivation, and emotion are powerfully shaped by culture. 
there were no compelling reason there was no compelling reason to think that personality traits would be any different. In a review of the Neo PIR, Juni had stated this view quite clearly. The five factor model and its tools are intrinsically bound to the culture and language that spawned it. Different cultures and different languages should give rise to other models that have little chance of being five in number or of having any of the factors resemble those derived from the linguistic social network of middle class Americans. But plausible as Juni's position seemed to be at the time, it was dead wrong. As studies in scores of cultures have shown, let me show you two factor analyses of the 30 facets of the revised Neo Personality Inventory, which in which corresponding factors have been placed side by side. The loathings in bold face show results from the self reports of 1,000 American adults. The loathings directly to the right are based on observer ratings of 12,000 adolescents and adults from 50 cultures. Using translations into 27 different languages, including Arabic, Indonesian, and Croatian. Yet these structures are essentially identical, as shown by factor congruence coefficients of 0.97 and above for each of the five factors. The FFM transcends language and culture. This is not some quirk of factor analysis. Many studies have shown that various properties of traits are amazingly consistent across cultures. For example, we looked at gender differences for the 30 Neo-PIR facets in a sample of 1,000 Americans and in a sample of over 10,000 adults from 25 other cultures. Here, I've plotted D-score differences in the American sample versus differences in the international sample. Each of these points is one of the 30 neo facets. As you can see in the upper right, women in the US and around the world report themselves to be higher than men in anxiety, vulnerability, and open to aesthetics. Men report being higher in excitement seeking, excitement -seeking assertiveness, and openness to ideas. Very similar results are found when self-reports are replaced by observer ratings of personality and there are many more examples. With a few minor variations, age differences in personality traits are universal. Person perception is also universal. Everywhere, raters can agree on trait ascriptions if they are well acquainted with the target. Everywhere, the same subtle differences are seen in the ways self and others describe personality. Everywhere, age and gender stereotypes of personality traits are very similar. Psychometric properties are consistent across cultures and translations. Behavior genetic studies suggest that the genetic structure of personality is largely invariant across cultures. Well, that explains it. Personality traits are not written by culture on a tabula rasa. They are an intrinsic, intrinsic part of human nature built into our genes and our brains. That, in any case, is the interpretation offered by the five-factor theory. A general personality theory that Paul Costa and I proposed to account for the body of findings that research on the five-factor model has generated. But the theory must explain more than universals. It must also account for the fact that personality is expressed quite differently in different cultures. For example, an extroverted American woman is likely to have many opposite sex friends, whereas an extroverted woman from a fundamentalist Islamic culture would not be allowed to. Her warmth and gre gregariousness would need to be expressed within her family or among her female friends. Again, people high in neuroticism tend to worry, but whether they worry about insider trading or plagues of locusts depends on their life circumstances. In five-factor theory, we say that these that traits are basic tendencies, whereas the beliefs, attitudes, habits, and relationships that express them are characteristic adaptations. Here is a schematic version of the five-factor theory. I can't go into full expl explanation of this model, but I would like to say a bit more about the fundamental distinction between basic tendencies and characteristic adaptations. 
Let me begin with the latter. <clears throat> because these are phenomena that all of you are very familiar with. Skills, attitudes, behavioral routines, roles, relationships, and the self-concept. We call them adaptations because they are acquired as the individual interacts with and adapts to the opportunities and requirements of the social environment. They are characteristic insofar as they are also shaped by the enduring personality traits of the individual. All students have to do homework, but the study habits of conscientious students are characteristically different from those developed by their less highly motivated peers. When we assess intelligence, which is another basic tendency, we often do it through an achievement test, for example, a vocabulary test. Knowing the meaning of words is not the same as being smart, but most people with large vocabularies, in fact, have high IQs, because intelligence facilitates word learning. Similarly, when we assess personality, we often infer traits by asking people about their characteristic adaptations. Here are a few neo-inventory items. For example, if we want to know if someone is high or low on gregariousness, we can ask them about the kind of work preferences they have, because these preferences are adaptations shaped in part by their characteristic level of gregariousness. But just as intelligent, intelligence is distinct from achievement, we use from the achievement we use to measure it, traits are distinct from the characteristic adaptations that express them. We consider traits to be basic tendencies, which are categorically different from characteristic adaptations, in the same way that vitamins and proteins are categorically different foods, different kinds of food, than Caesar salad and eggs benedict. Basic tendencies are abstract potentials that can only be realized in concrete manifestations acquired in a specific social environment. Five-factor theory goes beyond this conceptual distinction Five-factor theory goes beyond this conceptual distinction to posit a particular causal structure. As I noted, characteristic adaptations are influenced by both basic tendencies, such as personality traits and the social environment. That is not very controversial, nor is it revolutionary to say that basic tendencies have some biological basis. Otherwise, we're wasting millions of dollars on the search for personality genes. What sets five-factor theory apart from most other theories of personality is that it denies any influence of the psychological environment on personality traits. As you can imagine, this is the most controversial aspect of the five-factor theory, and it is surely an oversimplification. However, it is rem a remarkably powerful approximation to the truth. If personality traits are really insulated from external influences, they are likely to appear and persist in the same form despite a host of variations in the circumstances in which they are encountered. And several different lines of evidence suggest that this is just what they, what they do. This postulate of the five-factor theory, theory explains why personality changes so little across the decades of adulthood despite stressful life events, world changes, and years of watching television. Those things just don't have any lasting influence on traits. It explains why behavior genetic studies find so little evidence of shared environmental effects. It explains why historical events like wars and social upheaval leave so little imprint on the personality profiles of different age cohorts. It explains how primates can share some important features of personality with humans. And of course, it explains why the five-factor model is a good description of personality in all the diverse cultures of the world. One of the functions of theory is to stimulate research. It has been many decades since the, grand old, since the old grand theories of personality really served that function. But five-factor theory and some rival theories, such as Brent Roberts' social investment theory, are now being widely subjected to empirical test. Personality psychologists will certainly be interested in the results, 
but I hope social psychologists will also begin to think about the implications of saying that many of the phenomena that we study, characteristic adaptations like attitudes, beliefs, and relationships, are determined in part by personality traits that may be quite beyond the reach of experimental manipulation. Anyway, this is at least food for thought. Thank you, and bon appetit. <laughs>